All right. Um, welcome back to our third and final session of our spring cooking swap series. Um, for those of you who have uh, been tuning in over the last few months, um, my name is Kelly Burgess, and I'm the Family Consumer Sciences Extension Agent with the University of Kentucky Cooperative Extension Service here in Allen County. And we've been talking about how we can make simple swaps when we're cooking at home to make our favorite recipes a little bit more healthy. So we started out talking about how to make um, carb conscious choices. Then we talked about how to make our recipes lower fat. Um, and today we'll be talking about allergy friendly cooking. So um, if you have young kids at home, if you have an extended family, there's a good chance that somebody in your family might have some type of food allergy. So today that's what we're gonna be talking about is what kind of things can we do? Um, what kind of swaps can we make? What kind of recipes? are gonna be friendly um, for people who might have to deal with different food allergies. Um, today we'll be making red beans and rice. This is a favorite recipe from our Kentucky Nutrition Education Program. Um, it is excellent, flavorful, and easy. So we'll get to that in just a little while. Um, but first I wanted to talk a little bit more about food allergies and what they are. So if you'll bear with me just one moment, I am going to share my screen um, and we'll go through a little bit of information on food allergies. All right, so um, if this is doing what I think it's doing, um, you should be able to see the homepage for Spring Cooking Swaps Allergy Friendly Cooking. So um, I am a registered dietitian, so I love helping people learn how to make their favorite foods healthier um, and you know something that everyone can enjoy together. So let's talk a little bit more about allergies. What are food allergies? So um, allergies can kind of be a hot topic or a buzzword um, and you might hear it phrased in a few different ways. You might hear about an allergy, an intolerance or a sensitivity. And so these are really three different things that I wanted to break down just to provide a little more clarity as far as what we're doing with, what we're dealing with here. So food allergies are truly an immune system response. So you might have heard of autoimmune disease. Um, immune system is what gets activated when you are sick or you catch an illness. Um, so truly your body is having an immune system response to the food that you're eating. So um, it's usually you're reacting to the protein in a food. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that can be. Um, but the proteins are gonna be uh, the element of the food that is the smallest broken down form that your body is going to react to if you have a food allergy. And of course, we know these can have really severe um, symptoms. They can even be life-threatening if we don't know about them and they're not taken care of properly. So food allergies can be very serious. Definitely something to keep an eye out for. Second, we have intolerances. So in the difference between an allergy and an intolerance, an allergy, as I mentioned, is your immune system. An intolerance has to do with your GI system or your digestive system, your gut. Um, so a, an intolerance might cause some discomfort, some stomach cramping, some pain, um, but really an intolerance is due to uh, not being able to break down a certain part of the food. And that's what's gonna cause discomfort in your abdominal area. Um, so it's a digestive problem rather than an immune response. And then finally, we have sensitivities. And sensitivities um, is something that's a little bit more loose. It's kind of your catch all. Um, if it's not a true allergy or intolerance, um, it's just something that upsets your stomach. And you might see uh, the option for um, testing for food sensitivities. Um, what those tests are is for something called aminoglobulin E um, or IgE tests, um, but they're not very reliable. So they can tend to overdiagnose um, or give some false positives. And so you could end up avoiding foods that you don't actually need to avoid with food sensitivity testing. For that reason, those tests are not covered by most insurances. Um, and since they're not covered by most insurances, the reason why is because they're not very reliable. So that's just a little bit more difference um, or distinction on those. Uh, for sensitivities, you might hear about non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So this is in reference to people who have celiac disease or wheat, out, wheat protein allergy. Um, that non-celiac gluten sensitivity is an example 
somebody who wheat wheat products might tend to upset their stomach, but they don't truly have celiac disease. Okay, so we talked a little bit about this already, but what is my body reacting to? Um, as I mentioned, it's your body's mostly reacting to the protein in food. So for milk, that could be the casein protein or the whey protein. Um, for wheat, it is gluten. So we hear a lot about gluten and gluten-free. Uh, gluten is truly a protein found in wheat products, wheat, barley, and rye. Uh, so what people who have celiac disease are reacting to is that wheat, um, the protein gluten inside of wheat. So we all know symptoms to watch. Um, the symptoms of a, of a food allergy can differ uh, based on what it is person to person and also your age. So for example, it could be sneezing. It could be a fussy baby. Um, we've all heard about the itchy tongue, scratchy tongue or a throat um, feeling like it's closing in. Of course, those are more severe symptoms. Um, it can also be uh, gas and cramps in your stomach, um, difficulty breathing, a rash. Um, so there's multiple different ways that a food allergy can present, um, but it's definitely something that we need to be aware of any or all of these symptoms. So the most common allergens I don't know if you would believe this, but 90% of food allergies come from eight common foods. And so you can see them listed on the slide. They're milk, peanuts, tree nuts, soy, egg, fish, shellfish, um, and I think that covers them all. So unfortunately, those are allergens that are found in a lot of foods, um, especially processed foods. And so being aware of these eight major allergens, um, that will take care of 90% of the food allergy problems. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we can find those on the food label in just a minute. So here it is actually, we have that next. Um, so there was an act, this is a federal legislation called the Food Allergy Labeling and Consumer Protection Act. And what that does is if you look at a nutrition label below the ingredient list, you'll see contains wheat, milk, soy, eggs, um, any of those main allergens. And so if it's one of those eight most common allergens, they are required to put that on the label clearly where it says contains X, Y, and Z. Um, if it's a different allergen, say you're allergic to strawberries, that's not required to be labeled as contains. Um, so truly it's those eight major allergens and it's gonna be located right below the ingredient list. So what about hidden allergens? So this would be something like I mentioned, if it's not one of those eight most common allergens, you're gonna have to do a little bit more digging through that entire ingredient list below the nutrition facts panel on your food items. So when you're looking through, it's definitely helpful to know other names uh, for, the, um, for the allergen. So for example, if it was sugar, um, it could be listed as um, glucose, it could be listed as sucrose, it could be listed as um, corn syrup. I mean, any of those things, um, as we know, there's oftentimes a lot of different names for the same thing um, in a food product. So anyways, knowing the different names, that's something you can ask your doctor about, how might this appear on a food label, um, will help you be wise as you look through that ingredient list. I mean, knowing what to find. And I do have some more examples of that coming up. So how do you still get proper nutrition? Um, a lot of times with food allergies, we find that it can easily feel like your diet is very restricted. Um, for example, milk. Okay, now I can't have milk, butter, yogurt, cheese, ice cream, pudding. Um, so it can seem really easy to focus on all the things that you can't have when food allergies are present. But what I encourage you to do is to focus on the foods that you can eat. So um, let's think about the my plate. We have um, five different food groups. We have fruit, vegetables, protein, grains, and dairy. And so even if we have an allergy to something within one of those groups, let's still try and get foods from all five food groups. So um, I would say the allergies to fruit and vegetables are a little bit less common than some of those major allergens. Um, so fruits and vegetables are usually a safe bet uh, for people. We can get a ton of great nutrition from fruits and vegetables. 
Um, if you are allergic to gluten, if you have celiac disease, there's other grains that you can have, such as rice, oats, quinoa. Um, so go ahead and make that list of whatever area you feel limited in. Make that list of things that you can have that meet the same nutritional requirements. And that's something that you can run by a doctor or a registered dietitian. So like I said, get educated, get to know your swaps. So know what kinds of things that you can use in place of other things. If you can't have dairy milk, you know, know that you can have soy milk or almond milk or coconut milk. Um, all those different options are available to you. And if that seems overwhelming, like I said, I do encourage you to work one-on-one -on -one with a registered dietitian uh, who can work out a customized meal plan just for you to make sure that you're getting all of your nutrition needs met. And I put supplements on here as well. If you have multiple food allergies, if you feel very restricted, if you're having to eliminate entire food groups, um, supplements are something you might want to consider um, just because of not being able to get all of the nutrition that your body needs. Um, this is not something that I'm recommending a certain supplement, but it is something, a question that you can ask your doctor or your dietitian about, hey, is there any nutrients that I'm lacking in that I should consider taking a supplement for? And they would be able to guide you in the right direction on that. Okay, so let's zoom in closer on a couple of these really common um, allergens. So let's talk about wheat and gluten. Um, I mentioned on the slide that this will be physician diagnosed. So not self-diagnosed, my stomach hurts after I eat bread, um, but this is for truly physician diagnosed celiac um, or wheat allergies. Um, so wheat allergy versus wheat intolerance, I kind of gave that example earlier. Um, are you having an immune response? Or are you having a GI response? They're two different things. Um, I list on here some other things to avoid. So as I was talking about different code names or different words that things could be listed as on an ingredient label, um, we want to think about um, looking for all of these different things, not just wheat. So for example, bran, breadcrumbs, um, couscous, crackers, uh, graham flour, Protein, high protein flour, wheat gluten, wheat starch, uh, whole wheat or enriched flour. Um, all of those can be code, hint, hint, this might contain wheat or gluten. Um, a couple other things to check um, that may or may not contain wheat and gluten is things like gelatinized starch, hydrolyzed vegetable protein, modified food starch, natural flavoring, soy sauce. Um, so there's lots of hidden sources of gluten. So I put a few pictures on the slide, um, things that you wouldn't expect like ice cream, um, like a hot dog or processed meat, um, the sticky part of envelopes that you lick, um, gravies and sauces. Um, a lot of times wheat or flour is used as a thickening agent or an emulsifier. So even if you don't think of it as a grain product, there's a chance that there could still be some wheat or gluten hiding in there. So that's why it's worth checking the ingredient list on your nutrition facts panel for all of those things. So a little bit on wheat alternatives, um, you know, it can seem really limiting to not be able to have wheat products. However, um, there are other flours that are options. So for example, buckwheat flour, rice flour, potato starch. Um, some of these might even have a higher nutritional content than wheat. Um, I do recommend for baking, uh, there's all kinds of recipes out there online for different flour ratios. So you can just buy a plain gluten-free flour that's a one-to-one -one substitute for all-purpose flour, um, but you might find better success and better quality of results with your food items by using um, a mix of different flours. For example, almond, coconut, rice flour, um, and it depends on what kind of baked product you're making too. So um, if you are using a different kind of recipe or you're looking for a substitute, um, I would recommend seeing what kind of ratios are recommended because uh, it'll be different for say a cake versus a pancake or a brownie um, because you're desiring a different purpose for that ingredient. For sauces and thickening, 
Um, you can grind um, oats in a food processor, um, or you can use things like arrowroot starch or tapioca flour. Um, and those are substitutes that you can use instead of using flour as a thickener. So there's all kinds of options out there. Thankfully, um, not thankfully that a lot of people deal with this issue, but there have been a lot of products created to help out people who do have this issue. Okay, let's talk a little bit about milk. So that was listed also as one of the major allergens. Um, so we wanna think about how other milk products compare to dairy milk. So soy milk is going to be the one that has the most protein and is the most nutritionally similar to dairy milk naturally. Um, other milks such as almond, coconut, um, rice milk can have um, similar, for example, might have similar calcium contents, but it's because they're fortified with it. So when things are fortified, it means that we have added in a nutrient that's not naturally there. Um, so calcium is naturally in the dairy milk, uh, might not naturally be in some of the milk alternatives. It doesn't mean that it's not good. It's just about familiarizing yourself with how it compares nutritionally. Another thing to think about is protein. So for example, almond milk has very little uh, minimal protein where dairy milk has eight grams of protein per cup. Uh, so especially for children, if we're wanting to give them protein as they grow, um, thinking about which one of those milk alternatives is gonna provide the most uh, nutritional bang for your buck, if you will. You can see that they also differ on fat content as well. Um, coconut milk kind of is all the rage, um, but it does have a higher amount of fat um, per gram or per ounce. Um, so just knowing what your goals are um, and what you plan to use the milk alternative for. Um, thankfully, like I said, there's lots of options here and there's even different um, plant-based sources of yogurt and cheese as well for people who suffer, who suffer from a milk allergy. So um, this is, I got a little bit of head of, ahead of myself here. We're talking about substituting for dairy on here. So I'll let you take a look at what some of those other options are. Um, goat milk um, has different benefits as well. More calcium, more B6, more potassium um, than dairy milk. Um, let's see. Rice milk tends to be sweeter than cow milk. So that kind of makes sense, right? We think of rice as a carbohydrate, which breaks down to sugar. So it's a little bit sweeter than that dairy milk. Um, almond milk has a longer shelf life. So it, you can keep it in your refrigerator longer than dairy milk. I will say that's why I like almond milk because it doesn't go bad quite as quickly. Um, coconut milk, like I mentioned, higher in fat and calories. So just depending on what your goal is will help you determine what kind of milk alternative. And you might wanna use a few for different purposes and that's fine too. Egg substitutes. So I like to um, show this little graphic that shows how we can make a substitute for egg to use in different recipes. And, and just in case I'm in the way, I'm gonna move myself up just a little bit so you can see. Um, we have all kinds of options. So my favorite is the flax egg. We have one tablespoon of ground flax and three tablespoons of water. And that's equivalent to an one egg. So once again, based on what the egg is being used for in the recipe, it might determine which of these you do. Um, for example, the flax egg or the ground chia seed egg um, is going to be for thickening purposes. So I like to do that in a smoothie. It makes it really thick. Um, you can also do that in some breads, for example. Um, you can use the banana, you can use applesauce. Those are going to provide more of a dense, moist product. So you might not want to do that if it, you were using it in a cake, for example. So there are lots of options, thankfully. I did want to talk a little bit about children and egg allergies. 71% um, of children will outgrow their egg allergy by age six. So if your child has an egg allergy, it's super common, not something that you might have to worry about forever, because uh, there's a pretty good chance that they'll outgrow it. Also, 70% of children that have an egg allergy can tolerate baked eggs. So for example, egg is an ingredient in baked items, such as cookies or cakes or um, breads. And so even if they can't have a scrambled egg, they might be able to have an egg that's cooked. And this goes back to what I mentioned about the protein. So what the allergy is, is to the protein found in the food product. So when eggs are cooked, that protein is reshaped. 
and our body interacts with it differently. So when that protein is reshaped and reconfigured, your child might be able to have it in the cooked form. But it's definitely something to ask your doctor about and explore before just experimenting at home. Okay, on to the fun part. Today we're talking about red beans and rice. That's what we're gonna be making. And the reason I chose this recipe is because it's naturally free of all eight major allergens, which is exciting, right? Um, so this is something easy. You don't have to worry about substituting. Um, you can just start out with a recipe that's naturally free of all of those allergens. That's a safe bet for probably everyone in your family. So you can see I pulled uh, just a regular authentic Louisiana red beans and rice recipe and did a nutrition analysis on it. It has 550 calories um, per serving compared to our Kentucky nutrition education red beans and rice that has only 260. Now that is just for the, the rice or sorry, the red bean mixture. So if you add rice, you can add about 100 calories to that. Um, but you can see there's differences in fat and sodium as well. So I'm really excited to share this recipe with you today. And um, those are just some of my resources. A lot of our publications through the Cooperative Extension Service are available at your local extension office. So if you have more questions or you want more information, I encourage you to reach out to myself or your local extension office for more information on food allergies and what you can do about them. Okay, I will stop sharing my screen. And I think that you should be able to see my um, my camera in front of me now. So this is a crock pot recipe, um, which is really cool. It cooks for seven hours on high. So it would be the perfect one to cook while you're gone at work for the day um, or to put on overnight. Uh, I actually tried it out and did 11 hours on low instead of seven hours on high. And that worked out just fine. So you can adjust it based on what's good for you. Um, the recipe recommends a four quart crock pot minimum. That's what I did and mine was pretty full. Um, so you can use a slightly bigger, I think this is a six quart um, if you want. So I'll go ahead and take that lid off. And this is seriously as simple as putting all your ingredients in here and turning it on. So I'm gonna start with seven cups of water. I put it in a pitcher. Um, and the reason we're putting so much water in here is because we are using dried red beans. This is a very economical option here. Um, these are small red beans and um, they came in a one pound bag. So you're just gonna open that bag, pour the whole thing in your crock pot. Beans are a great source of fiber and protein. Um, they're, you know, most people don't have allergies to them. Um, so we'll go ahead and put the beans in there. And I'm actually gonna share, um, a different view. Let's see. I'm going to let you see from up above for a minute what exactly I'm putting in here. We have a half a pound of smoked turkey sausage and I wanted to make a comment about this. So if you remember you saw the hot dog on my slide for wheat allergies and sometimes it's because wheat is used um, to hold these to hold the processed meat together. So I looked at the nutrition labels and I found an option that did not contain wheat or any wheat associated ingredients. So this is just an ingredient to look at a little bit more closely um, before you go ahead and decide to use this for your allergy friendly recipe. But there are options available. You just have to look for it. Okay, and then the rest is all veggies. So we're gonna be adding three stalks of chopped celery. And they don't have to be even chopped up super finely. I left mine a little bit bigger because they're gonna cook, they're gonna get soft and they will kind of break down. We have one green bell pepper. Put that in there. And we have one chopped onion. I used a chopper because uh, I like my onion pieces really small. Um, if you don't have a chopper, you can definitely chop it by hand as well. Um, but that will save just a little bit of time if you're in a hurry. Okay, stir that around a little bit. And then we have three cloves of garlic chopped as well. So we're gonna add in our garlic. And I'm gonna go ahead and move us back to our front view because we have one more ingredient to add in. So I'll move this out of the way just a little bit. Let's go back. Okay. 
You should be able to see me up front now. And we're gonna be working with our spices. So this is another thing I wanted to talk about as far as allergy friendly. So the recipe calls for Cajun seasoning and I'm not advertising any certain brand. I just picked up one that I had at home that you will probably see at the store. Um, it's Tony's um, Creole seasoning. So anyways, like I said, not advertising this brand. This is just a common Cajun seasoning. But when you look at the label, um, it tells you, let's see. I noticed online when I was looking um, that it might contain um, or that it was manufactured on equipment that uses milk, soy, and wheat. So even though Cajun seasoning in and of itself should not have the major allergens, it was on the same equipment that has three of those major allergens. So what I decided to do, um, since there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to have that, is I've decided to make my own seasoning. And I've also shared this recipe uh, with you in the video link, but this is just a generic Creole seasoning blend uh, that we're going to be making ourselves today to put in here to make this an allergy friendly recipe. So I'm going to start out with, um, I made half the recipe, so I didn't want to have too much left over. So I'll be doing half of what it says on that recipe link. So I have one tablespoon of onion powder. I have one tablespoon of garlic powder. I have one tablespoon of dried oregano one tablespoon of dried basil. I have half a tablespoon of ground thyme. And this smells amazing as you're putting all these things in here. Um, we have half a tablespoon of black pepper. Keep your nose away from that or you might sneeze. <laughs> um, we have a half a tablespoon of white pepper, half a tablespoon of red cayenne pepper, And then we have two and a half tablespoons of paprika. That's what gives it that nice red color. And then we have um, one and a half tablespoons of salt. So that it does seem like a lot of salt. I haven't done the math, but I'm pretty sure that by using, um, by making your own, you're probably gonna end up with less sodium than you would with a pre-mixed seasoning. And it's up to you how much you want to add. So if you want to use less sodium, if you're watching your sodium intake or if someone in your family has um, blood pressure issues and they're watching their salt, um, you can choose to add less sodium than what the recipe calls for. So I like this blend because not only is it more allergy friendly, but it also gives you control over how much sodium you're going to be using. So I'm going to mix this together. One of my favorite things to use to mix um, dry ingredients is actually a whisk, which might sound a little weird at first, but it just really blends up those ingredients. Um, I think it blends it better than a spoon does. because It really uh, just gets in between everything and lets it get mixed. So this looks really similar to the Cajun seasoning that you would buy at the store. Um, another advantage of mixing up your own seasoning blend this way is that it's more economical. So if you don't use Cajun seasoning a whole lot or Creole seasoning, you might not want to go to the store and spend a lot of money on a special seasoning just for this recipe. Also, you might not have time to go to the store. You might decide to make this and maybe you have everything at home already besides that seasoning. Well, you can mix up your own seasoning. You can save time. You can save money and control a little bit more about your allergens and your nutrition factors. So I encourage you to think about making your own seasoning blends. You can also do this with other things like pumpkin pie spice, for example, um, just other uh, seasonings that are a little bit more expensive to buy pre-mixed. You can generally make them yourself with products that you already have at home. So our recipe calls for one to two tablespoons of this seasoning mix. And I like my stuff flavorful, so I'm gonna add two tablespoons. I'm gonna just mix it in our crock pot here. All right, and I'm gonna switch it back to this overhead view just for a moment so you can see uh, what all is in here. You can see it get mixed up. And that is as easy as it gets, friends. We will put this um, on either high for seven hours or low for about 11 hours. 
and those beans are going to get soft. Um, they're going to burst a little bit um, and their vegetables will be cooked down. All those flavors will be mixed together. You come home and your house will be smelling amazing. Um, so this is also a great recipe to use for a busy uh, weeknight because it saves so much time. Um, you can prep ahead by having those ingredients chopped up already. That'll save you a ton of time. Um, and so I really encourage you to try this as a quick, as an affordable, as an allergy friendly meal option. So uh, thankfully, since this does take a while to cook, um, we have one that I have already made. So I'm gonna move this one to the side here to be plugged in to cook later. So we'll go ahead and close our crock pot down. That's ready to cook. Move it back here. And we have one that is fixed already that I'll move to the front. I cooked this overnight, as I mentioned. So I will actually go back to this overhead view again so you can see. Um, it's a little bit liquidy, um, so it's a little bit runny still. And generally, when you think of red beans and rice, I think of a thick mixture uh, that just goes perfectly over that rice. So what I've decided to do, I think would be a great way to finish this up, is to get out your potato masher. And with the potato masher, you can kind of just use it directly in the crock pot. Um, and mash up those beans a little bit. So it's gonna help those red beans um, get broken a little bit so that it's not just so much, um, so much liquid with the individual beans. This will really help get it blended together into a little bit thicker of a paste. Um, so anyways, I'm just gonna mash this for a few moments. And what I've made to have with this is long grain brown rice. Um, I like the brown rice. I think it gives even more flavor, more of an earthy, um, earthy flavor to your dish. Um, you could also put this over quinoa if you wanted um, or other grains. But this is a great, great recipe. Um, like I said, super simple, high in fiber, very healthy, lots of vegetables. And it's even something that picky eaters might like. So if you have somebody that doesn't like peppers or onions, um, you can see that there's not a lot of big chunks of peppers and onions in here. Um, it's mostly, it is mostly all cooked so that those items are just flavoring your dish rather than being big crunchy pieces of things. So I'm going to dish out a little bit of our brown rice into our serving bowl here. Let's use our spatula. So as I mentioned, um, to eat this recipe with about half a cup of brown rice is going to be that recommended serving. And um, this is a hearty, this is a hearty meal and it makes great leftovers too. So I filled the bottom of my bowl with the brown rice. And then I'm just going to spoon some of my red bean mixture over the top of it. And this looks delicious. Um, one thing I do recommend is topping this with some green onion. Um, I don't know if you have a home garden this year. If you do have a home garden and you've grown some green onions, they're the perfect thing to chop up on top of this recipe just to give it a little bit of extra flavor. So um, that is all that's as simple as it is. You have your Creole seasoning blend that you can use for other recipes as well. Um, so once again, if you have any questions at all, um, if you're interested in learning more about um, healthy cooking, allergy-friendly meals, please don't hesitate to contact us at the Allen County Extension Office or contact your local Extension Office if you're watching from afar. Um, so we hope that you have a great day. We hope that you've enjoyed the spring cooking swap series. Um, let us know in a comment below um, if you plan to try this recipe at home or feel free to take a picture and share it with us uh, when you try it at home as well. So thank you for joining us for our last uh, session of spring cooking swaps, and we hope that you have a great day.